Thank you, Antonio, for your impressionist painting picture. <laughs> and I think now it's time for questions from uh, the floor. We, I think we have uh, at least 15 minutes for your questions. Can I ask you to introduce yourself before addressing the question? Maybe we need the microphone. Thanks, yeah, it's uh, Jeremy Fleming Jones from PAR. I just wanted to ask, uh, Antonio, you said that economists are becoming more involved in cartel and especially in bid rigging determinations. And I wondered if you could uh, perhaps expand a little bit on that and explain why you think it might be the case and apart from the asbestos example, if you could perhaps give a few more examples of, 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 this, of this trend. Well, we have, we're going to have a hearing tomorrow with six economic submissions, so that, and that's a cartel. So this is really just an empirical <laughs> proof of what I've, I've just tried to, sell, to say. Um, cartels normally, you know, as I said, it's a lawyer business. Uh, Tommaso Valletti yesterday was saying that they account for a tiny proportion of, of their work. Also, he was saying that uh, in the European Union, perhaps the leniency program is somehow drying out. And uh, the more it dries out, uh, the more you know, the units uh, approach economists in order to understand if you know, the lack of um, leniency applications can be somehow uh, counterbalanced with more economic evidence. Um, at the same time, of course, uh, you know, I don't think, I think that a lot of the involvement is also related to the type of evidence we are able to gather uh, through down rates. So the more, uh, you know, if you, tr if you really manage to find, and that, that still happens in, sta in some more small markets, all the necessary elements for telling a story about, you know, these companies really meeting, monitoring the agreement, etc., we would not really be involved. Uh, however, as I said, a lot of the uh, documents that would be on, on a file uh, would be circumstantial evidence, even in terms of communication. And um, parties would normally come up with, uh, even if, you know, cartels or agreements of this kind are by object infringements, parties would normally come with stories that tell you, look, in any case, you know, this agreement has not had an effect. So traditionally we've discarded these uh, statements very easily. It was a lawyer's business saying, okay, but this is a by object uh, infringement. It remains a by object infringement. Uh, we are even looking more into the details of that. So we're trying to see whether the conduct actually that we observe in the market is consistent with the story uh, we are telling. That, of course, depends on the particular case, on the particular type of market on the evidence um, uh, that we have. So in Italy, uh, in the past few years, we didn't open a lot of cases through leniency applications. We opened it through other means, and that, I think, opens a lot the door to, uh, to economists. Hello. Paolo. Yes. Okay, uh, well, my name is Isabel Sanchez. I work for the European Commission. And I've got uh, two questions. Maybe they're a bit technical, but maybe you can help, yeah. Um, how do you do, if you can explain briefly the market segmentation you do for the contracts and if you take into consideration the thresholds of public procurement, if it's local, if it's uh, open, if it's international and all this. And uh, the second question is again on uh, rebates. And I would like to ask if, as an award criteria, um, in the public tendering of Italy, uh, you're using uh, the rebates, because uh, then uh, if, well, if a tender or a company knows that we'll, win, we'll have more points by making a rebate, then uh, you're kind of promoting the behavior you or whomever sets it as an award criteria, so. Yeah. Well, I, um, I'm not sure, so market segmentation, so we look at it in terms of, you know, the behavior of company, say in the asbestos case, we are three arsenals in different areas of uh, Italy, 
And actually, we were observing that uh, a firm was only bidding for one city, say. And sometimes, actually, it was not the case that it was the closest city. So it was actually the city where it was the incumbent. Um, so, I mean, that's the type of, say, market segmentation we would think about. So, say, we have different lots for different Italian regions that have been defined by the uh, central procurement agency, for instance. So, uh, tender design was already market segmented in terms of different lots uh, corresponding to different territories. And what we observe, therefore, is that the pattern of bid uh, is such that you know, they avoid to compete in uh, all the geographic territories. Also, they are placing cover bids in some uh, geographic territories uh, and, and not others. So uh, normally, it's related to the, ten to the choice by the procurement agency of, the, of you know, having geographic uh, lots say, for instance, in one tender. And, and then what you try to see if, whether there is really or not a lack of uh, overlap between, uh, say, the bids or there are cover bids, and at the end of the day, um, what you end up with is a situation in which, say, often happens incumbents just got their place back in <laughs> where they, so they, they will continue to operate where they were uh, operating before. Uh, so the second question is about rebates and why we use them. Um, I, I actually really not sure I'm the best person to, to, to answer that question. Um, of course, when we think about rebates, uh, as I said, there's always this, um, you know, two things to, to, to be linked at, uh, looked at. It's often the case, I mean, we start from a reserve price that is defined by the a procurement agency. So now procurement agencies are normally well equipped and uh, good enough to come up with good reserve prices. And um, uh, of course, when we do a proceedings, I mean, firms would that would be the first uh, defense by the company. We didn't bid because the reserve price was not correct. So how do we judge that? Uh, often uh, we do some benchmarking. Uh, it is normally the case that the, you know if you have local tender for a particular service, um, we could look at uh, similar tenders even in the same region sometimes. Uh, so if we are convinced that you know uh, the, the, the the products that are tendered out are the same, they're not, uh, and we are comparing apples with apples, then we could use uh, benchmarking. Um, of course, it's not easy <laughs> for us then to say whether that reserve price was uh, too high or too low. And, uh, of course, and in the case I was telling you about, in some cases it's, uh, there is also some um, uh, trend or historical, uh, actual not trend, but some change in the, in you know in what you observe. So before the agreement in the asbestos market, we were observing uh, large rebates. Uh, when the agreement took place, rebates dropped to one percent. So geographic benchmarking, historical benchmarking, not a lot of perhaps of economic modeling in this case. Uh, If you score more points in a bid because of having rebates, then how it can be an indicator of, uh, of collusion? If you have so an economic you, you most five points for the rebates on a contract. And then so of course, you have all the technical you know, points that you award for the technical details, but at the end of the day, what you're trying to do in a collusion scheme is to try to get the tender at a good price for you. So what you're trying to do is to extract somehow rent in a suppressing competition. So, uh, of course, if you are thinking about having a cartel between only a subset of firms, you might be worried that your agreement would be undercut by other companies, but otherwise, the purpose of the agreement is to have a good price for the companies. So, um, of course, you know, there are all the technical details that uh, normally those would be, uh, you know, the thresholds would be all be uh, met by the companies in, in the market. And uh, crucially, often it is the case that the economic um, 
uh, points that are awarded that are key. When, you know, we have to balance the two things, we do take that into account. So, for instance, we think, okay, given the technical uh, points that you would have taken, what would have happened if you had bid a different price? So, we take perhaps one thing for fixed, the technical side of it, and we think about, okay, but what if you had bid a, a higher discount? What would have happened? So, in that case, we, we take that as fixed. So, <clears throat> one difference that we discussed yesterday between bid rigging involving public contracts, at least in some countries, including Italy, and collusion in a typical market is that bid rigging in public contracts is a crime. And so, I wanted to ask to Bill whether this is the case also in the US and to the Italian speakers whether like investigations involving bid rigging in public contracts take place uh, exploiting the fact that you can do the investigations together with the judiciary and together so also with police force that have like have a certain attitude toward conducting investigation have different means to collect evidence in the US the uh, cartel offense is usually uh, enforced by the public agencies with criminal sanctions. Uh, in uh, the, the, the use of circumstantial evidence that we've been discussing uh, tends to be useful in the U.S. either in determining whether there was an agreement in a private civil case or as an indication to the Department of Justice about whether to use intrusive data collection techniques to get direct evidence that would be used in a criminal case. But the Department of Justice only uses direct evidence when it prosecutes criminally. So the techniques we've been describing might be used to launch a dawn raid, to conduct an investigation, but the Department of Justice will not prosecute a criminal case using circumstantial evidence. They are concerned that they will not get convictions, it's the highest standard of proof. They want proof that is more powerful, more ironclad. It doesn't mean that they always win when an individual challenges, uh, resists, uh, and says, I'm willing to go to trial. Uh, but uh, far more often than not, they get plea agreements because they have assembled overwhelming direct evidence. Uh, and it's not simply the competition framework that involves criminal sanctions. There are three paths to bringing criminal sanctions to bear on someone who rigs bids. There is the competition law criminal prohibition. There is a separate set of prohibitions involving public procurement that involve serious fraud, and those are routinely used. Uh, there is another channel that involves a larger category of behavior involving making false statements or false representations to the government. Uh, for federal practice, it is routine for tendering that the tendering parties are required to sign a document that says, I certify that I established my tender independently and not in coordination with anyone else. That's called a Certificate of Independent Pricing Determination, CIPD. If, that's a f if that is false, that is uh, regarded as a false statement which is the subject of separate co collateral criminal prosecution. So the tendering party knows that if I've participated with these guys, and I sign that document, that's another count in the complaint that will be brought against me. And then there is a further channel that involves perjury and obstruction of justice because the people who are under investigation frequently panic and try to destroy evidence so they lie about what they're doing. So if we looked at the typical complaint involving bid rigging uh, uh, of the kind we discussed in public tenders, one count antitrust criminal violation, count two, government procurement serious fraud violation, count number three, false statement for signing that instrument that said that I did it independently, count four, 
as soon as the investigation began, you tried to destroy evidence uh, so that the government is basically coming at you in four directions. And because it is all orchestrated by a single ministry, the Department of Justice, uh, they don't face any of the problems in coordinating behavior between a civil prosecutor and the public prosecutor. They have complete vertical integration, and they are very experienced at chasing after you with all of these, all of these tools. Just a brief uh, comment on the Italian side. I mean, you are right. The um, uh, bid rigging in, in, in public procurement uh, as a, is the only case in, in Italy and in most of European countries where also there is a criminal effect. No? So uh, I think that there are already some cases where uh, there are two, two hypotheses. One, the cooperation in the exchange of information between the investigation in the criminal side and the investigation in the, the, pub, the public authority side, the competition antitrust authority and also there are cases where the competition authority made its uh, investigation then passed all the information to the uh, criminal prosecutor in order to make their own investigation. I think that these cases are still ongoing. We do not have, uh, uh, I mean, final decision, at least in one very big case that uh, involved the public procurement on uh, uh, the facility management of, pub of uh, public schools. It's very known. But I think that if I can add just, just a, few, uh, a few words, uh, the, the, the public procurement enforcement is the perfect storm in the enforcement of competition law, we, we, because we can have public enforcement criminal enforcement and also private enforcement. No? It is, to, to me, it's the only area of antitrust enforcement where we can register this. And to me, again, it's uh, a duty for public contractors to go against the infringer to act for damages. And this, again, in the name of public. Uh? OK, so this is the next session. It's a perfect trick with, with the next section. Thank you. Antonio. So maybe we have time for the last couple of uh, questions. Yes, hello. Um, congratulations on your, on your great presentations. My name is Penelope Giosa. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom. And I'd like to make a question to all the gentlemen. Uh, since the uh, plus factors are not legally binding, in the sense that there is not any legal statute outlining them, can you bring into your, in your mind an international cartel where there, were, there was disagreement between competition authorities regarding whether a plus factor was existent or not? Because I can see that there may be a lot of approaches depending on different from country to country about the existence or not of a plus factor, what it is a plus factor, if there is any. Thank you. Uh, I, as you say, uh, the development of this jurisprudence has all been, uh, dare I say, in a civil setting, a matter of common law elaboration or interpretation. Uh, agencies might develop guidelines uh, that spell out what they're trying to do, and they have, but none of these factors appear in the text of a statute. Uh, so for a, a firm operating in a multinational framework to uh, develop uh, the, the painting of the lily pond that describes what different jurisdictions are doing would require uh, uh, looking at each major institution and seeing what they do. The Commission in Brussels, the Department of Justice in the US, uh, Brazil, uh, in, 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 in Latin America, uh, uh, the member states like Italy, to develop that framework. And, and I think across the framework you would see a great deal of commonality. You'd see that, that many of the considerations uh, uh, fall out. It's, it's really been, this is an instance in which it has been uh, the academic community that in many ways has, has been uh, the factory through which the ideas have been developed and processed. Uh, for two reasons. One, one is to take the conceptual framework, 
but the, the two innovations that I think have been very important, one is the one that Antonio was emphasizing a moment ago, which is the, the, the modern approach to building an investigation and developing a case is to provide a narrative that explains how the cartel was formed and how it functioned. To join up the evidence with that framework, uh, that was a useful academic contribution to say, here is the, let me show you the architecture of the narrative. You go and get the evidentiary pieces that support it to tell the story that Antonio was mentioning. But the second thing that is done, and there were uh, many useful comments about this yesterday, which is collectively, the procurement community and the competition committee community have a massive database of experience. What Marshall and Marx did so well is to say, we're going to go back and read all of that stuff. And by looking at these individual episodes, we will derive lessons about which forms of behavior are genuinely important and are worth looking at more, most intensively. Uh, uh, that is to take this huge body of experience and align it with the conceptual framework. And I think when one does that, uh, it provides, it does two things. It provides a good, a good indication of where agencies are going. But many of the companies you mention are major purchasers. Maybe one day they're doing a cartel, but at the same time, they have large procurement departments, don't they? A reason they should be interested in all of this is not just for the purpose of compliance on the procurement or on the competition side of the world, but they should be instructing their own purchasing agencies about how to design their own tendering to defeat collusion, but second, more and more of them are showing up in the courtroom as plaintiffs. Uh, this is a real profit center for organizations like Deutsche Bahn, uh, which shows up all the time as a major litigant chasing after people who've overcharged it in uh, supplier cartels. Paolo, you have the privilege of the last question? No. So, we, there is any other question from the floor? Okay. Thank you, uh, and I hope that you will join me to thank all the speakers for the excellent work.